powered by the Montana Television Network. This is the 10 o'clock news on Q2, Montana's news leader. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Janelle Slade. Jay is off this Friday. Well, the U.S. government is now in its third partial shutdown this year. As the day went on, a shutdown grew more likely as the midnight deadline approached without an agreement, and the Senate and House adjourned until Saturday at noon. Well, as expected, Senate Republicans did not have the votes on Friday to pass President Trump's demand for $5 billion in border wall funding. But Senate talks continue into the night. Natalie Brand has the latest from Capitol Hill. As the House and Senate adjourned until Saturday, the government headed for a partial shutdown at midnight. That means funding is set to run out for nine federal agencies that employ around 800,000 people. Those deemed essential, like air traffic controllers, will have to work but without pay. Nearly 400,000 others will be furloughed. Meanwhile, Senate Democrats and Republicans agreed on Friday night to continue discussions to try and strike a deal. Talks remain focused on funding for President Trump's border wall. We said to President Trump a week ago, his wall does not have 60 votes here in the Senate, let alone 50 votes. That much is now clear. Senate Republicans support a measure the House passed on Thursday that provides more than $5 billion for border security, including the wall, but that's been a non-starter for Democrats. The White House and congressional leaders have been talking since Friday afternoon, but it's unknown at this point what kind of compromise the president would support. It's up to the Democrats, so it's really the Democrat shutdown. Lawmakers have said they wouldn't return for a vote until leaders from both parties reach an agreement and one that the president would sign. President Trump continued to push for the wall on Friday, tweeting this design, which he called effective and beautiful. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Capitol Hill. And early this morning, the president praised Senator Steve Daines for his suggestion to take a nuclear option in order to pass a funding bill. Now, this would eliminate the filibuster and only require 51 votes to pass a bill. The man accused in a sophisticated sex abuse ritual that rocked the town of Miles City was in district court today. Also late today, the former high school athletic trainer was charged with with in federal court for allegedly enticing minors to the internet. 78-year-old James Jensen pleaded not guilty to 10 felony counts of child pornography this morning. Just this month, Jensen was arrested when a housekeeper told police she found images of teenage boys involved in sex acts on his home computer. The district court judge read aloud today, making sure Jensen understood each of the charges and the punishment they carry. The judge continued bond at $100,000, plus added numerous conditions if Jensen does post bond. However, attorneys we spoke with today in court say that's not likely. Well, as for today's federal indictment, U.S. District Attorney Kurt Almey says Jensen faces federal charges for coercion and enticement of minors related to the use of the Internet. That new indictment goes back to 1995 until 1999 in Miles City. Charges state Jensen used the Internet to entice an individual who he believed was a minor to engage in sexual activity. Attorneys tell Q2 the dozens of victims who claim Jensen sexually abused them as teenagers are now being forced to cope with what happened. Attorneys tell us that involves therapy and support groups to help each other in the healing process. 31 male victims have come forward in a separate civil lawsuit saying they were student athletes when they were abused by Jensen from the 1970s up until he left the school in 1998. All of this started when Jensen reached out to victims on social media just months ago. But those victims, now grown men, then reached out to Miles City lawyer Dan Rice. Rice, who also attended Custer County High School, says his clients have been forced to dig up emotions and abuse that, abuse that they haven't dealt with since they were kids. You know, there's some strength in numbers. They, they get to get together and, and talk and, you know, d discuss what they're going through, you know, in their home life, work life, personal life, um, and with the case. But uh, they're getting stronger every day. And uh, I think we're going to move forward in a positive way for them. Now the victims have families and careers. Many of them still live in Miles City, others in Billings, Helena, and Bozeman. Their attorneys, Dan Rice and John Heenan, say Jensen's victims dot the country. Many of them even talk weekly on conference calls. Well, some community members tell us this decades-old sex abuse case has brought a dark cloud over the community filled with some shame and cover-ups. We asked several people today how they're coping with the stigma of this case. 
Some said they were shocked to hear the details. Other, others admitted they asked their own kids who attended school at that time if they were victims of abuse. And one man said he would have never guessed the abuse was taking place. I knew Jim. Our kids were in school and seemed like a nice guy. You know, I, I don't think I ever had a conversation with the man, but I seen him at the sporting events and stuff. And no, I thought he had credentials. Now that more details are coming to light, many are questioning why this school allowed the alleged abuse to go on for so long. Now, just this week, the attorney representing the Miles City School District told Q2 in an email, quote, the district will be opposing all of the plaintiff's motions. We disagree with the facts presented. Well, the state corrections department has undergone a major reorganization with the stated goal of streamlining its management. But former employees say the changes weeded out some workers who had criticized top leaders and also eliminated a program that had been highly touted just last year. MTN's Mike Dennison reports. Just last year, Governor Steve Bullock visited the Riverside Recovery and Reentry Program in Boulder and praised it as highly successful. But in September, the Corrections Department announced it would shut the program down. They said the facility will soon house 20-some male inmates who are now in a Lewistown infirmary that the state decided this summer to close. The former head of the division overseeing Riverside says the program at Boulder did an excellent job helping female inmates recover from addictions and prepare to be released. It was a cutting-edge, highly regarded trauma recovery program for women. There was a population out there that needed that, and the program was staying full. But this summer, McKenzie says department leadership stopped inmate referrals to Riverside in an apparent first move toward closure. Governor Bullock's office and corrections officials say the women at Riverside have been moved to privately run programs, which had empty beds that the state was already paying for. They also say closing the Lewistown Infirmary and moving its male inmates to Riverside will save the Corrections Department $2.7 million this year. McKenzie questioned some of those savings, noting that some of the private beds remain unfilled. She also said the state arranged a meeting to tell Riverside workers about the closure without even telling her or Riverside superintendent about the September 25th announcement. A September 21st email from Riverside Superintendent Dan Kistner asked, Will someone tell me what is going on? This is extremely unsettling and embarrassing. My employees are coming to me asking what's going on, and I don't even know what they're talking about. Change is hard. Change is always hard. But change is much easier to work through if people sit down and talk about it and develop plans and do planning and understand the reasonings for it, and none of that happened. The new male inmate is supposed to be here at Riverside this month. The contractors are still working on a $550,000 renovation of the buildings. Now, correction officials say the new residents won't be showing up until at least March. Reporting from Boulder, Mike Dennison, MTN News. Thanks, Mike. And corrections officials say there's been a decline in treatment bed usage, not just in Boulder, but statewide. Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke gave his first interview since his resignation was announced by President Trump last Saturday. Q2's David Jay joins us now with more on Zinke's appearance on the Fox News Channel's special report with Brett Baer. David. Oh, Janelle, uh, Ryan Zinke said uh, President Trump did not force him out and that the distractions outweigh the accomplishments. Brett Baer interviewed Zinke who talked about uh, President Trump's policies. He told Baer that the Interior Department has been one of the leading conservationists, uh, opening up uh, millions of acres of hunting and fishing along with 39 wildlife refuges. And he said that uh, climate is changing and there is a responsibility to manage the dead and dying timber to prevent wildfires. And the secretary defended allegations against him. I've never seen the level of anger, of hatred. Uh, they have threatened my wife, my family, trespassed on our property, put signs around the neighborhood. They have lied, cheated, and make false allegations. Uh, this country needs to take a deep breath uh, and understand we're all Americans. This is Zinke also said investigations into those allegations against him have shown uh, no wrongdoing. He also said he exercised what the president wanted and led the interior in the right direction. Secretary Zinke will leave at the end of the year. Janelle?
Thanks so much, David. Now, turning to weather, Bob, whether it's by plane or car, there's going to be a lot of people on the go these next few days. Oh, yeah. And some busy airways and roadways. Oh, yeah, very busy today. In fact, there are 6.7 million people going to travel wow. through the airways today. So we thought, well, what about any uh, delays? Are there anything like that going on? Well, we did find a few and take a look. In western Montana, not much going on. The western half of the country, not much going on as far as delays. We do have a little light snow falling at Salt Lake City, where it's 33 degrees right now. But you'll notice as far as airport delays, nothing in Montana at this hour. In the western part of the country, we had a few delays over in San Francisco. Those have since cleared up. But take a look at the east coast. Big thunderstorm storms over there and now that has just gone zero. They were at uh, two hours over at New York delay, uh, at Newark. They had a two hour delay. It looks like now all that, that has been cleared up. So some good news there. Now back here in Montana, there's what we have. We've had gusty winds, had winds gusting to 79 miles per hour. Glacier browning at 70 mile per hour winds, Livingston 67, 60 over at Big Timber and uh, Billings Airport had 58 mile per hour winds today. We'll have the rest of your weekend forecast coming up in a few more minutes. All right, thanks, Bob. It's now been a decade of Hearts for the Holidays by Hardin Chevrolet. Now, each year, the company holds a vehicle giveaway to someone in need, and it's all a big surprise. This year, Nicolette Haley Albung of Hardin walked away with the big prize. Nicolette has spent the past 12 years teaching students in her community to read. Hardin Chevrolet was touched by her work in Hardin, and they decided to present her with her own new car. Congratulations. Coming up on tonight's 10 o'clock news, we look at why the shortest day of the year is the longest night for those without homes. And later in sports tonight, wait till you see tonight's comeback between Central and Skyview. Scott shows us who holds on. You're watching MTN News with Jay Cohn and Janelle Slade. Storm Tracker weather with Bob McGuire and sports with Scott Green. This is the 10 o'clock news on Q2. Montana's news leader.